this training is made possible thanks to a TIG grant uh, to the Northwest Justice Project in partnership with Pro Bono Net and LSNTAP. So welcome to the webinar today. As some of you may have seen from the description, this features 50 tech tips focused on project management, collaboration, communication, and a few fun ones thrown in. We'll also include a segment uh, with some homegrown tools towards the end and resources developed by and for the legal aid community. And we hope that you walk away from today's webinar with some tools and tips to empower you to do the great work you are doing more efficiently. And today, in terms of our panelists, we have Reese Flexner from the DC Bar, Samantha Kirkostas from Illinois Legal Aid Online, Juanita Negron from the Florida Justice Technology Center, Jenny Singleton from Legal Services State Support in Minnesota, and myself, Jillian Thiel from Pro Bono Net. And we also have Brian Rowe and Ket Ng from the Northwest Justice Project, uh, who will be popping in with various comments, etc. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to our first panelist today, Jenny Singleton. Hi everyone, uh, thanks. My name is Jenny Singleton and I am the Legal Services uh, State Support uh, Legal Technology Project Manager here in Minnesota. Um, so I'm just going to share a few tech tips. Let's see, The first one uh, is a browser extension called Grammarly. And I first uh, started looking for something like this when um, I ran into some problems with typo showing up in different items I was posting on uh, our Pro Justice site that I wasn't catching since there's not a built-in spell check editor um, and a lot of online uh, editing software. Um, so Grammarly just installs into your browser. I've used it with both Firefox and with Chrome. And then it'll um, act just like a word spell checker would act, so that it'll highlight any misspellings that you have. And then if you hover over that, it'll pop up um, suggestions for how to correct the misspelling. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed using that uh, where there isn't uh, a built-in spell checker, um, but I am having to type things in, usually in a browser setting. Uh, the next tech tip I have is uh, creating a template email in Outlook, which seems like a pretty basic thing, um, but it's a little bit buried within Outlook. And one of my coworkers actually uh, showed me how to use this. But if you're ever sending out uh, kind of a stock email, so for example, I do one for people who don't qualify for a Pro Justice membership, uh, then you can create a template email to address that. And the way you do that is, uh, Type in your email as you want it to appear, uh, and then click Save As. And then under the Save As type, choose Outlook Template. Um, and that'll save your email uh, as uh, a template email that you can then pull up later. And then once you've got your template saved, um, to use it, this is also a little bit um, buried within the functionality of Outlook, but uh, if you select New Items and then uh, choose more items, then you can choose choose form, click on that, uh, and then you'll uh, be taken to a pop-up box and you'll look in user templates in file system and then that'll bring you to a screen that will list all of your template emails uh, and you can just choose to open that email and then you can edit it and send it like you would with a normal email. And there's a quick question, which version of Outlook or is this across all versions of Outlook? You know, I've only used this in uh, the 2016 version, uh, but I believe that you can use it in other versions as well. So the next uh, tool that I wanted to share is a presentation software called Prezi. Uh, and this is an online alternative to PowerPoint. Um, and it, it's set up a little bit different from PowerPoint in that instead of advancing different slides, uh, you have an overall picture and then you zoom into different parts of that picture uh, to, to walk through your presentation. Uh, so it's really great for showing the information within the context of the, um, the broader idea. So it's really good for, uh, for example, if you're trying to show how a process works, and you want to zoom into different steps in that process, but still show how they fit into the overall 
uh, it's, a, it's a great system for that. Um, it's also just a, something that's a little bit different from the typical PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you can have a free account, uh, but if you have a free account, then all of the presentations you create are available to other users to see and to uh, reuse. Uh, they have paid options that allow a bit more privacy, uh, but I've been good with just a free account. The next tool is uh, called City Maps to Go, uh, and I recently stumbled upon this when I was in Europe last year uh, and was trying to figure out a way to navigate different cities when I didn't have a cell, cell phone plan that was working. Uh, and City Maps to Go provides you with downloadable offline maps, uh, so when you do have uh, an internet connection or you're back home and you have your uh, cell phone plan, then you can download the maps that you're going to use and then once you're um, out of range, you can still uh, use those maps and then it'll use your phone's GPS to uh, show where you are uh, on the map. Uh, you can also select different points of interest that you want to uh, have saved onto your maps. So then once you're, say, wandering around Paris completely lost, you can pull up your city maps to go um, and it'll show you where you are in relation to wherever you're trying to go which will be one of these red or blue stars that you can see here on the screen. Um, so I've found that to be, to be a pretty fun tool for traveling. Um, and that's also free. The next tool is um, a website called Codecademy. Uh, and this is, again, um, a free website that you can use to learn basic programming skills. Uh, so I recently did, did a, a JavaScript course, uh, and I have you know, very little programming experience, but it was a good way for me to come, become familiar with a lot of the basic commands uh, so that when I am coming across those and some of the like quasi tech work that I do, um, I have a little bit of a more understanding about how everything is working together and functioning. Um, and they have uh, courses on a variety of programming language. Uh, and then they also recently, I think, launched uh, a course on building a website and managing a website. The next uh, tool is an app that's called IFTTT, or uh, which stands for If This Then That. Uh, and this app basically integrates various other apps and devices uh, so that you can select a trigger uh, that will then cause something to happen. So for example, on my phone I have it set to pull the NASA image of the day and make that my wallpaper on my phone. Um, and there are just so many applications for this. Um, but for example, if you have your uh, house set up as a smart home with uh, different Wi-Fi integrations with your, say, your alarm or your lights, uh, then you can have your location trigger various settings within your house. Um, so they have a lot of stock recipes, and then you can also build your own. Uh, you can use it to keep track of different types of news items. Uh, you can have it uh, keep track of when a keyword appears in the title of an article uh, on various websites, uh, so like the New York Times, or I've used it when I'm hunting for something used on Craigslist. You can have it send you a notification anytime uh, a search item comes up. The next tool is also kind of a fun one, uh, but that's Bitmoji, which is another app. Uh, and this just allows you to create an avatar, and then it can uh, it puts your avatar into different clothes and then has different messages that your avatar can be saying. Um, so one of my coworkers also has Bitmoji, and we like to send each other funny Bitmojis uh, during conferences and things like that. The next tool is called TweetDeck, uh, and uh, I'll give a shout out to another coworker of mine, Emily Good, who told me about this one. Um, and I'm not much of a Twitter user, but uh, for those of you who are, TweetDeck allows you to have uh, a column view that uh, you can see different columns with different categories of things that are coming through Twitter, uh, like search results or uh, likes for different users, uh, hashtags, etc. Uh, and it can be useful. At conferences too. Uh, you can have uh, various people who are sharing one account uh, and have different levels of access. Uh, so you can have those people doing different things with your Twitter account. Uh, and then you can also schedule tweets to go out in advance with TweetDeck. 
Next, I have PictoChart, uh, and this is a, a website that allows you to create uh, different graphical representations of information, uh, and it has a series of stock templates that you can use uh, to make uh, your, your information look pretty. Um, so we've used this for, uh, this is an example of something that we, we created when our uh, law help site went mobile uh, that just uses pictures to show everything that law help does. Uh, and this also has free basic access. Uh, as, and then if you want to do more or have more templates, uh, then you can upgrade to a paid account. Uh, next tool is Optimizely. Uh, Optimizely is a really, really cool uh, tool that perhaps you've heard my colleague Mary Kachorik uh, talk about. At, uh, she, she did a presentation at TIG on Optimizely, but we've used this uh, to run experiments to figure out how changes that we're making in our websites are impacting traffic to different parts of the website. Uh, so we, we've used this a lot on our homepage with the right-hand uh, buttons that lead to different parts of the website to see what happens when we rearrange those buttons, what happens when we make the buttons look different, uh, give them different wording, etc., to see um, how we can manipulate the site to make sure that people are getting to where we want them to go and where they need to go. Um, we've been able to run all of our experiments with um, just a free basic account, um, but again, there, if you want more access, uh, then there are paid accounts that you can get. And then finally, the last tool is called Office Lens, uh, and Office Lens is a scanner app that integrates with Office 365. Um, you can take a picture of notes, you could take a picture of a whiteboard, and then the app uh, reformats it so that it, it's more legible. Um, so you can see in this example, it's kind of aligned it so that uh, the perspective is correct. Uh, and then within the app, you can sync it and upload that document uh, to your Office 365 account. So that is my last tech tip, and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Sure. So there was so, a, oh, go ahead, Brian. There was a quick question over um, Prezi. <laughs> And they, yeah. they were asking for a little bit more detail on uh, how it works for you or what some of the, the positives are um, on it. Let's see. Good. Yeah, so basically you create a presentation. So what you see on the screen is a presentation that we did to explain what our office does in Minnesota. Uh, and then if you clicked on the right-hand arrow, it would zoom in to where you see those brackets. Uh, and then if you clicked on the right-hand arrow again, it would zoom in again to uh, a little bit lower where you see the next graphic, or the next set of, next set of brackets. Uh, so the advantage is that you kind of have more of a graphical presentation of uh, what your uh, presentation is. Um, and then you have control over where the uh, presentation will zoom to, uh, and then you can have it, for example, uh, zoom into a set of brackets and then zoom back out into the full screen uh, to give the user an idea of how what's in the brackets uh, relates to what's what the full picture is. Uh, yeah, so we'll, hopefully. we'll look at doing a short video on LSNTAP that, that demos this. I've used this for other projects outside of legal services where you're trying to tell a story, you've got a progression, you kind of have a map, and you're moving from spot to spot. It's much more fluid than PowerPoint, and it works really well if you're creating videos with voiceover. Uh, just it's less jarring. I really like the program a lot. Mm-hmm. Caroline also commented that she that at, uh, and at her organization they use IFTTT to respond to people who text mass legal help to say that they have been denied an interpreter and it works in five different languages. Wow, that's a great use for the program. And we also had a couple. Um, we also had a couple. Um, I know that Jenny has shared in some great ideas for uh, user user experience, and um, and uh, so 
we had Kate sharing in some ideas that I've shared out with folks around some other resources around user experience and, and thinking about good ways to present information and a couple other good tech tools. And then we also said, um, Molly mentioned that she has used Prezi for content on their Law Help site in Colorado. All right, so we'll go over to our next presenter, Will Nada. Excellent, so uh, I'm Will Nada from the Florida Justice Tech Center. And I've split up my tips into different sections. Um, the first section involves digital security. Um, uh, if you guys are in the LSN tab um, listserv, you probably um, had seen that we did a few um, kind of data, um, data ethics and data security um, webinars last month. And one of the things that uh, came out of that is that people were rightfully so they were they were interested in um, in learning what they can do with like limited information about these issues um, what kind of things they can implement in their offices um, basically a lot of this information offices realized that it was important and they needed to look closer at it but they wanted they wanted to have a resource to if they don't have the information in-house, like where can they go to? So I had to ask um, around um, a few colleagues that do in this area, and they actually made me aware of Access Now, which works on uh, data um, security issues both in the U.S. And, and internationally. And they actually have a digital security helpline, um, which is available um, to civil society groups. I checked in with them, legal aid groups would be um, would be part of that and it's basically a free service that they do where they would actually do um, a general assessment of um, an office's digital security risks and then they would um, probably through like a series of phone calls um, just try to put together a very simple kind of plan of, of areas that offices should look um, should look into um, in the months to come should look into increasing security. So uh, the information for that, uh, if you visit Access Now, the website, um, and their digital security helpline, you, you will be able to, uh, to get the information on how to contact them. It's, uh, it's either through, e it's mostly through email that you initiate, and then you would set up um, some phone calls, and then depending on the location of the legal aid program, they even do in-person consultations and training for staff. So when I found uh, this resource, uh, I wish I had had it for when we did it, the, the webinars last month, but I'm, I'm now passing it around to different programs that are interested in, in exploring their digital security risks. Great, so then the second tip is, um, it's another add-on that you can add to your Firefox or your Chrome or your Opera. Uh, browser and it essentially encrypts the communication with um, that your browser has with like major most major websites not all of them and um, so it's it's if you're um, on, on your website and this is a resource that you can also pass on to to clients but if you want to be able to use some of the the major social media sites um, but you don't you want to protect those communications um, make them more secure, you can add on this browser which was developed by the Electronic Fron Frontier Foundation, um, which again does a lot of um, international and national advocacy around encryption and making communications between civil society groups and journalists more secure. Uh, so this is a really uh, interesting tool that, that um, it's kind of, it's, it's protection, it's invisible, uh, you don't, it's not, you don't get like a tangible um, uh, tangible uh, outcome from using it, but it's essentially a way of increasing um, your knowledge and your awareness of of how um, the various like communicate the the websites that we use um, could be added on with layers of protection to um, to protect the, the our browsing of certain sites that we wouldn't want. Um, 
you know, in most common contexts, it would be government um, surveillance, but it just increases awareness and, and knowledge about these kind of um, security issues that arise when we're just browsing and using websites like Facebook um, and other major social media sites. The next um, set of tips um, are dealing with increasing uh, the accessibility of the resources that we, that we develop. One of them is, and many of you guys have been using this already, but sometimes a lot of our clients are using um, browsers that are not the most current ones. And so I know for myself when I've created um, websites or web pages or content, I've often had to um, try to uh, find tools that let me see, like, you know, Firefox version 11. Um, just to try to see, try to troubleshoot issues that people might be encountering. Um, there's a there's this website now, browsershots.org, um, which is free. Lets you basically test out uh, co website compatibility issues for all of the browsers um, at once. And this is, um, for example, I I, I tested you know, FloridaLawHelp.org on here, and then tried to see if there were any particular um, browsers that um, are still fairly current um, that may may um, may be affecting um, the way that content is showing up and the usability of the website. So I found that resource um, really useful as far as because there's there's already a lot of re tools that let you test um, a small selection of browsers, but this one does all of them. So it's pretty comprehensive in that sense. Uh, the next tip um, I really fell in love with um, because when in in this in the legal aid community when we think about increasing the re readability of our content uh, we often think about uh, like font size or the size of the, the text uh, sorry font style and there's actually a really popular tool that I found that that based on, on study and analysis that they've done, the, the best way um, th that they have found to increase readability is actually um, the color, um, making the colors of the text differently. And um, there's a whole science to that, which you can go to beelinereader.com uh, and it goes into their whole study of, of how they found that when there's large chunks of text, which, what help people the most is that uh, is kind of like that um, color variation um, that has high contrast levels. So as you can see, it goes from dark blue to lighter shades of blue and breaks it up with red. So it interchanges between various levels of blue and red. And, um, and, and this is actually a plugin for Chrome as well. Uh, so it's for me, uh, when I'm looking at producing content, I uh, use it to for my own to increase my own read, readability but also um, I'm looking into how to make that available for maybe the Florida Law Help website um, how to feature it somewhere that as a tool for people to also be able to um, increase uh, to be able to download it and just increase their read, readability but generally I thought that the the concept of, of using color um, as a way to break up large chunks of text, I thought that was like a really interesting and new way to think about how um, we can increase the readability of our content. Just a quick comment, um, Will Nate, I think it's interesting on the just announced California Public Library System has adopted the um, Beeline Reader browser oh, plugin. Fun. That's great. Yeah, so it's, um, I would definitely check it out and then just use it for your own. Um, start off by just using it yourself on, on the various websites that you use, especially like news articles. Uh, the, the next tool is uh, dealing with content development and internet marketing. A tool that, that's really interesting for looking at content ideas is um, answerthepublic.com. And what they've done is that I'm sure that if you go to Google, you can see um, the variations of uh, whatever you're searching for that are the most popular. So what they've what they've done is that they've 
taken they take the information from um, the Google search engine and if you in in their website if you put in um, keywords it will visualize and list um, all of the popular variations that of for that for that particular phrase um, as questions um, but it'll kind of break it down into really interesting lists so like right now if you were to put expungement in Florida in Google um, it might show you um, just a couple of them and they've kind of uh, taken all of all of the ones even the ones that are not that popular and then broken it down so it's uh, so you can get ideas for for content and also you get interesting little visuals which you guys might not be able to see that um, break down the various topics and it's it's too small to to look at it but if you guys look at the one that looks like a spider web uh, it shows what are the how questions which are related to expungement of Florida um, which are to the left and then what are the which questions that's on the top and then the who and the what um, when people are searching for expungement of Florida what are those different types of who which um, and what questions related to that and if um, and then that gives you an idea for um, producing content and then maybe how to like how to it also gives you like ideas for titles for that resource uh, and it's it's also free to use and this one is uh, it's also a free tool and uh, many times you may uh, when you increase or decrease the size of a photo um, if you don't put in the right um, pixel information most times it'll get distorted so uh, this this tool just if you're creating content for social media or for print materials uh, you can upload pictures and uh, change reduce their size um, and be able to not lose the quality of it so it's it'll basically it'll essentially do the the automatic um, pixel correction that needs to go on so that you can change the size of a photo without um, ever losing the quality of it and um, yeah and that's the website uh, this tool was was a uh, one born out of academia that's available for free now and it's sociovis.net and um, there are similar tools um, to this to be able to map out um, Twitter conversations and um, Twitter uh, the relations of, of different uh, conversations and who the players are I find this one to be very uh, comprehensive in the sense that you can get a lot of this information um, all of those charts and, and diagrams are all available in their WAN dashboard um, all you have to do is, uh, when you visit here, you have to create an account. Um, there is an option to pay $9 a year to be able to search a higher number of, of tweets, I think like a, over a thousand, a thousand and more, but otherwise if you don't want to pay the $9 a year, um, there's, there, you can search up to um, five or six hundred of the past tweets for it, whatever term that you're looking for. So. Um, I think I for this example I had I was using I was researching just conversations related to A to J uh, and it identifies who are the most active uh, people um, who are the most influential what are the most common hashtags if you look towards uh, which is really interesting to know like what hashtags you can pig piggyback off um, if you look at the diagram on the on the right bottom side it shows you it breaks down what the specific tweets are who did it and the hashtags that they used um, so again you can scan conversations related to a topic and then try to piggyback off them using common hashtags that are being used and then you can also if you look at the social network map you can um, uh, map out and see the which is you get a, a really good um, over oversight of uh, what online discussions related to access justice what they look like like what what does a community look like um, not offline um, 
and see if they resemble real life. So that those charts in the top are like the various people that are talking about these issues and how they relate to each other. So it's it's really a, a pretty comprehensive, and it can really help your um, your in, make your interactions in Twitter be a little bit more strategic and maybe more fun uh, than just kind of like the retweeting of stuff that that we all um, kind of fall back to on a day-to-day -day basis. And then my, uh, the next section is like cool things that you can do on Google Docs and Sheets, which um, I really uh, love as well. There's, I, if you guys haven't been on the add-ons list for Google Docs, I would suggest you check it out because there's, there's a wealth of really interesting add-on tools that you can use, that you can uh, integrate into your Google Spreadsheets and your Google Docs just to um, make increase their um, their effect and how uh, their usability to, for, for their functions and ultimately to help you reach uh, to help you um, achieve what you're trying to do faster and easier um, through a lot of the add-ons that are there. Uh, this one, if you're anything like me, you probably have hundreds of of Google Docs uh, of files on your drive. And um, you can actually get a complete list of all of your files on your Google Drive on a spreadsheet um, if you add on the files cabinet by Awesome Table. Um, again, you would search, you would open up a Google Doc and and select add-ons uh, to be able to, and then you can search by the name. And uh, for example, you can see uh, this is just a small snapshot of what my Google Docs list, which was like hundreds of of uh, rows long and it shows me the link, it shows me um, who the owners are when I created it and and then I kind of I kind of do this kind of auditing every uh, six months just so I can uh, delete things that are not needed anymore uh, and make my Google Drive more manageable. Uh, the next add-on that I like is the Google Drive audit report add-on and if you are working with many different people and sharing Google Docs, it's uh, good to, again, every six months uh, run this tool. And this one differs in that it, it shows you uh, who has access to that file. And um, and it's just a good auditing thing it, um, to be able to, to just get a hold of, like, how much information are you sharing and with who and, you know, is it share, being shared with the appropriate people? So uh, this is a, a sample of the audit report that I that you get after um, running this thing. It shows you the the title, the link, and then it shows the editors and the level of control. Uh, it's hard to tell in this, but there's a column for who has access, uh, and it says you know anyone with a link can edit. Uh, it's private, and then specific editors um, are is on the last um, right hand side column. There, so it's um, again. I do this like every six months to just, just kind of review um, who has access to my files and whether I want to continue to make things um, public. Uh, so that's a useful tool if you have a lot of Google Drive files. Um, this one I'm, I'm currently experimenting with, and there's actually an ability to send SMS messages from Google Sheets um, by using cl CloudCom SMS and uh, I'm exploring this for Florida Law Help um, for our website and the, the way that I started is I'm just collected a bunch of my friends uh, um, telephone numbers because I'm kind of testing it out and um, and then uh, I'll, I'll run through the experiment, but essentially once you download this CloudCom SMS, uh, all you need is the name, a column for the name of the person, um, their telephone number. I, I got the phone numbers of uh, friends from uh, across the country so that um, I could test, you know, would it reach someone in California, in New York, in Florida, uh, just kind of just testing the limits of this tool. And then, as you can see in the box, it says, what's, what's your message? And uh, in this particular case, I'm just kind of seeing, you know, can I send someone a link to, like, an eviction, the eviction page on Florida Law Help? And um, so my friends, it, essentially it works, and I've been sending my friends uh, 
weird uh, Florida Law Help link SMS te text messages, and they've just been like, "What? What is going on?" But now, now they're used to it, and um, that the pretty exciting part is that it it actually works. And I would definitely um, uh, ask you guys to download it if it's something that interests you, and then just play around with it in your office. Um, there's you could use it for communications with your with like your staff. Um, you could use it if you wanted to um, do a little pilot, know your rights pilot SMS program where maybe you wanted to get people's phone numbers and send them um, particular resources at different times. There's a, there's a way to schedule these. Um, obviously, when we want to send information to our clients, there's there's more protections that need to be put in place as far as like uh, their telephone numbers and um, making them aware that they would be receiving this and that it wouldn't necessarily say this is from the you know this legal aid organization it says cloud.com which is a service um, but it definitely works and um, it's something that that I'm gonna explore and I'm happy to report back on on what happens with Florida in the months to come so that's cloud.com SMS add-on uh, the other add-on is a uh, and this one people may have been using already, but it's it's a uh, you can add on the translate feature and then be able to instead of going to the the Google Translate page, just be able to do all of the translation within the Google Doc. Uh, the translations are inputted uh, immediately. Uh, there's a way for you to to select for the translations to be input onto the Google Doc. Um, this is all in one dashboard. And then you can go ahead and it makes it just the, the tweaking and the the changes and the review that need to be made to Google Translate translations. Um, it's done. It's it's helped me to do it a lot faster and um, a lot easier with uh, with this Google Translate feature that just um, helps to input the translations and then I can just kind of review them and make edits. And then the, yeah, that was it. Excellent. Let's uh, move on to Reese. Hey guys, I'm Reese Flexner from the DC Bar Pro Bono Center, um, and my tips are a lot more abstract than <laughs> what everyone else has been sharing, um, so bear with me a little bit. Um, <clears throat> first of all, when you are considering a project, um, the planning stage is very important because you need to get all of your needs and wants out on the table beforehand. And what I mean by that is every, you have your needs, which are the core functionalities that your project needs to serve. Um, but don't just stop there, because a lot of times people aren't ambitious enough with their original plan for their project, because you know the startup cost of a project and putting in all the resources to starting it a lot of times it's one of the biggest expenditures, just getting the whole thing moving. And so you also want to identify your wants and your ideals and any cool thing that you could possibly think of that might make your life easier or might make your tool better. Um, and the reason for that is once you get your core functionality down, um, it might turn out that implementing one of these extra features actually is really cheap or is really fast or ends up being much more important than you thought. And it actually wasn't just a want, it was actually a need. And it would have been something that, had you not thought of it beforehand, now would have to be integrated backwards into this big system that you've already mostly built, which is very inefficient and a huge pain. <clears throat> Oh, other way. Um, and then the counterpoint to that, though, is don't overbuild things. Um, talk to the people who are actually going to be using your program, and once you have a prototype and once they've started to test it, if there's anything that they that they feel just isn't necessary or doesn't really help them, uh, 
don't be afraid to uh, kind of undo some of the hard work that you've done and just cut it. Um, don't keep developing something and perfecting something that the actual users don't want or don't need. Um, and a big reason for that is um, going into the future, that part of your project is going to have to be maintained. It might have the opportunity to break other parts of your project or make them less efficient. Um, a lot of times if you have, um, say like you're, even if you're just working on a website, for instance, if you have a link there that sounds like it does something that it doesn't do, a lot of users will click that one link, see it's not the thing they wanted, and then just exit your website. Um, and so you want to have as few kind of dead ends in your project as possible. Um, and one way that you can accomplish these things is to keep your projects very modular. Um, try to build different parts that do uh, different things. Um, keep all that together and make it so that those different parts interact with each other in a very standard way. Um, and that's going to make it a lot less painful to trim off a feature that you decide isn't worth developing anymore or to add on new features that um, ended up being more important than you thought they would be. And also, going into the future, if all of these parts interact in the same standard way, it's going to make it easier for future developers of your project to plug things into it. Um, and another kind of key principle that kind of underpins all of what I've been saying is that iteration is the key. Um, you want to constantly be making incremental steps and giving it to the people who are actually going to be using it or you know, to team members or friends and family. You can just bug them into looking at your stuff and seeing what they think of it. Um, because really what it comes down to is, A, you don't know what's actually going to be helpful or most useful. Um, your users actually don't really know what's going to be helpful or useful until they start trying it. Um, and a lot of times, some small feature or something that was just kind of a throwaway or even just like a tool that only the administrators thought they would use but that you left open in the beta end up like becoming a core part of the project and can shape the future of where the project's going. Um, and another advantage of iteration is you don't go too far before you figured out that you before you figure out that you've messed up, um, because you will make lots of mistakes when doing any sort of project, um, and the quicker that you can figure out what those mistakes are, the better. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is very important: document everything that you do. Um, so all these things that I've been talking about, the needs and wants. Um, how the different pieces interact with each other, things that you have tried but ended up not working, have some sort of standardized way to keep track of all of these because you're probably not going to be working on that project forever. Um, if you have a contractor, you might not hire them back again. Um, <clears throat> in the future, when you want to either change your project or improve it, um, or develop it in any way, if you don't have really good documentation, they're going to go down all the same dead ends you went down, and they're going to have to reinvent the original vision of what the tool is supposed to do in the first place. Uh, so that's all for me. I only had five. Great. Great. So I just um, noted a couple things in the chat box, but um, there are some really good tools to assist with um, some of these 
some, I think, that are really good best practices. Um, I've found that Instapage and Strikingly are two really good tools to help uh, develop some minimal, minimum viable products, so to speak. So you can just whip something up really quickly um, and get a, a web page that's up um, online just to see how that would look and, and you can use it to distribute it to users. Um, there are also some really great um, business, Reese, you talked a little bit about gathering business requirements. There are some really helpful templates online. Um, if you just do a quick Google search um, for, for gathering that information. Um, my personal favorite resource is closing, it's a website called Closing the Gap, or uh, yeah, Closing the Gap, it's a business, um, or excuse me, it's called Bridging the Gap. Um, it's a really great business um, analysis uh, tool resource. It's a blog, but they also do a lot of posts and have a lot of materials on that. So great, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Samantha. Hi there everyone, this is Samantha Kierkostas. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? We sure can. Great. <laughs> So I am Samantha Kierkostas. I'm the Development Director at Illinois Legal Aid Online. And Illinois Legal Aid Online uses technology to increase access to the legal system. We make sure that people can make informed decisions and understand their legal options when they have to go to court on their own. And we are actually in the process of completely tearing down and rebuilding our primary technology, which is the website Illinois Legal Aid Online. And so some of my first tech tips that I'm going to share with you today are actually related to some of the rebuilding and some of the decision points that we've addressed and the, the choices that we've made as we've moved forward to rebuild a resource that is more user-centric. Oh, hold on a sec. And so the first thing that I want to share with you are user personas. And many of you might use user personas. They are representatives of the types of people who are coming and using your services. We've actually got five user personas. The two that I'm going to share with you here today are our public users, so people who are coming to our website, IllinoisLegalAid.org, to um, access information. And we found through um, a lot of deep digging into our analytics and some user testing that we actually have two primary types of users. One is a person in crisis and that's Christina and then the second is a motivated learner and what these have been really useful tools these have been really useful tools in order to um, make some decisions about how we're building things. They have not only their goals and challenges listed there but we also see um, what operating system they're using and what browser they're using, what type of access they have to a mobile phone and whether or not they are using it actively, what their level of comfort is in using that device. And this informs how we are building tools for mobile and for desktop. Um, and all of this is based on uh, user testing. And the next tool that I want to share with you is Optimal Workshop and this is a tool that our user experience team uses to test some of the new navigation resources that we've got on our site. So this is a great tool if you want to figure out whether or not the um, navigation or decision or uh, language that you're building is actually um, true to how users experience it. So we create these tests and we send users through them to figure out if our way of thinking um, is the same as our primary user base. So uh, here, for example, is a task on one of our user tests in Op Optimal Workshop and it's a way that the, so the, the prompt is you want to learn about student loan forgiveness and our prompt to the um, the tester is in which category would you search for this? And then following uh, 
they go through the top level navigation, the second level navigation, and then they find it there. And the results are really valuable because they can show us if um, only 20% of the people actually clicked through to the correct spot. And if it's split, if 50% of people go through school and education and another 50% go through money and debt, well then perhaps we need to build in on the back end something that allows for them to reach it from two places. And so this next tool is called Balsamic and it's something that we have used to start user testing from the very beginning. Uh, one of the things that we have found so valuable as we're sort of building a new tool that's really based on who our users are is testing right from the onset. And so we have, you know, even before there was a website or a prototype or anything, we could go out into the street. All we needed was Balsamic, which is free to download for nonprofits on, onto your hard desktop. Um, and we could go out, for example, and say, here are two versions of a mock-up page. In one place, the button's at the top for legal professionals. In another place, the button's at the bottom. And we can ask people on the street, in the courts, where it seems most accessible to them. And then we're getting user data that is uh, true and it can help inform our decisions in terms of how we design and build our site. Um, the next tool some of you may have used, it's a web accessibility evaluation tool. And it's a way to make sure that you are um, similar to the tools that Will shared make it, you are making your site as accessible as possible to all users. And um, you can type in any, this is our home page, but you can type in any link and it will identify for you areas where there's perhaps missing alt text or um, one of the really interesting things that we found is that the link color that we chose for our new website actually was the contrast between the white background and the color of a link was not um, up to second level accessibility guidelines. So it's a tool to sort of check your work to make sure that if there are folks, consultants, or contractors working for you that um, whatever you're building is meeting those same uh, accessibility guidelines. And this next tool I got from our technical director Gwen Daniels and this is a tool that she's just, she has been using quite a bit as we develop and build new new pieces and modules to the new Illinois Legal Aid Online and um, one of the cool things in Chrome is you can inspect an image or a, a site and you can change the CSS and then those changes are reflected in the browser so instead of actually having to go in and make those changes and push them into a dev uh, environment, you can see them temporarily so that you can make decisions more quickly um, when you are trying to figure out, or if perhaps you're working with someone else and you want to show them a few options. It's a quick tool to be able to um, build. Um, this next tool is another free for nonprofits tool. It's called New Relic and it's website performance. It's sort of a, uh, takes your site's blood pressure, if you will. It's kind of like a quick health check. And what's cool about it is it shares with us what the user experience is like from, um, from the standpoint of the act, from from the actual website's perspective, so not not its content or um, its its flexibility, but rather how quickly is a page loading? Are there any issues that can be addressed <clears throat> on the back end that will make the user's experience from their computer or from their from their mobile phone more um, to, to improve the experience so that they're not faced with sort of another barrier to the system. Um, Gwen, our technical director, gets this monthly e or this weekly email on Mondays, and it's a chance for us to just see how things are doing and to identify any potential issues that we can go in and fix. And again, free for nonprofits. Um, the next tool is Canva. Uh, 
So in addition to development, I do a lot of our external communications and fundraising. So a lot of these next tools are um, tools that I use when I am wearing my fundraising hat and communications hat. So Canva, many of you might know, is um, a great tool for folks who don't have any native design skills but need to attract uh, need to create some attractive images on social media. Um, we all know that you know images get more hits, and I wanted to create some images to go along with content that we were pushing out there. So Canva is a really simple tool to do that with, and in fact, I um, I created this quick little image here, 50 tech tips, um, and it took me about 90 seconds. So if you are charged with creating some uh, some images for a campaign and you don't necessarily have the in-house staff, it's a great tool to um, build something that's attractive without uh, spending a long time. It's a great efficiency tool. And the next tool is uh, similar to one that Jen shared. This is called Genius Scan and it's another one of those ways that you can use your phone as a scanner. Um, this I found really useful if I'm out in the field and I need to sign something and send over a version but I don't want it to look like the, it's a, has a poor image so it improves the image quality and then allows you to send off to whomever you need to the necessary document and this is a iOS app, I think Android too, uh, but I use it on a, an iPhone and it is a great, really simple tool. Um, Hootsuite, I'm sure many of you know about and use. Similar to TweetDeck, this is something that you can use to share share and schedule posts via multiple social media sites, uh, social, social media channels, so not only Twitter, but LinkedIn and Facebook and, and others if you use them. And the thing that I want to highlight here is how useful the tool can be in terms of um, creating less work for the following year. So here you'll see this is our um, a sample of our past scheduled tweets from October 2015 and a great thing that I can do is go back to these tweets and reshare them. Oftentimes if you have an editorial calendar that highlights particular themes or um, holidays at different times of the year, your content is pretty similar. So it's a great sort of reminder that uh, you can actually go back and retweet things and reschedule things so that you're making less work for yourself. Uh, and then the last tool is another one that I use quite a bit, which is um, ride sharing tools. I think they are a complete lifesaver, especially when you need to get quickly from place to place. Um, in my capacity as a fundraiser, I plan a lot of events, and oftentimes that requires uh, transportation of a ton of materials, whether it be, you know, some cases of wine or program books or or signage, and um, sometimes it just doesn't make sense to bring a car into the city if you're working in a metropolitan area. And these two tools are great for transporting people and materials um, without any real. Uh, Pain. So those are my tech tips. I will uh, hang on for Jillian to pass the baton on to herself, I guess. So again, my name is Jillian. I'm the Training and Field Support Coordinator with ProBonoNet, and I work with ProBonoNet sites on helping them to uh, talk about how to maximize and get the most out of their sites. Um, and I also do some internal uh, process improvement for our own organization. And so my first tip is to ask people how they work, not what they do. I love asking this question when I'm out networking or socializing. I find that instead of asking people what they do, if you ask them or if you quickly ask them how they work after what they do, it's a great way to get an understanding of how people think and what tools and processes they might use. I actually got this tip from Lifeha Lifehacker, and I've gotten several tips as a result of that from speaking with people in marketing or um, business development. It's as nonprofits 
we often have to wear many hats, and so I find that this is a really great tool. My next tool is CoSketch, and this is a multi-user online whiteboard that is designed to give you the ability to quickly visualize and share your images, your ideas as images. And I really like this tool. Oops, give me just a moment. I really like this tool um, because it allows you to really simply share. So anything that you paint will show up for all other users in the room in real time. And then it's just one click to save the sketch as an image for embedding on forums or blogs, etc. And it's also zero, zero hassle. It runs in all common browsers without plugins or installation, and it's free and without registration. So just to give you an example of how I use this, I had a complicated concept I was working through uh, working with one of my colleagues who's based in our New York office, we were having a conversation about trying to map out a system for our new help desk and what that would look like. And we were both having, we're both visual learners and we're having trouble, um, we, were, we were describing it but just wanted to make sure we were on the same page so I spun one of these up and we were just really easily able to um, map out our workflow um, really easily able to sketch something out. So it's something that's a little bit easier than using like balsamic if you just need to get something on, on the ground really quickly. And my next one is makebeliefscomics.com. Uh, this one is a little bit more fun, but it allows you to create your own comic strip. Uh, similar to creating memes, um, I like to do this. Um, to do a shout out to a colleague, send it around. Um, it's just a fun, creative way to do that. Um, I also, um, I, I'm not sure if anyone's used it on Law Help to describe concepts, but I know that animations have been a popular thing and this, this is a free tool um, to, to jazz up uh, your site. And it's really easy. I put this together in about 90 seconds. And I hope you all enjoy the joke there. And my next tool is g2crowd.com. This is a great tool if you are asked to look into a tool that might be a good to compare different tools. I often get a lot of questions from pro bono net from pro bono net admins on can you recommend a, a third party survey tool or I had to do research recently on good help desk tools so I was comparing Zendesk and, and other items. Um, so this has 86,000 plus business software reviews and it provides pricing and product information along with side-by-side -side competitor information and user reviews. I found that this is a pretty nice tool. There is a paid version that you can that you can access as well, and they do some of the comparison for you. But if I'm just doing something that's uh, first blush, and I have ga gathered the user's requirements, what they need, um, I'll go ahead and hop onto this site and do a quick comparison. And I really like how they have the user reviews. Um, and the rating system and then the comparison. I find it to be really helpful. There are some other, I should note, there's some other software comparison tools, but this one is just the, it's very user friendly. The next tool that I like to use is called My Radar. It is a mobile app that displays animated weather radar around your current location that allows you to quickly see what weather is coming your way. All you have to do is start up the app and your location pops up with animated weather. And then there's a standard pinch zoom capability which allows you to smoothly zoom and pan around the United States and see what the weather is like anywhere. Now what makes this tool different from other weather apps, I'll just give you a little anecdote. I'm a California raised girl, uh, was recently visiting some family in Michigan and had to drive from had to drive in the middle of a huge snowstorm and I realized I needed to 
drive back to the airport and wanted to get a sense of when the storm was coming in. And this was the only tool that I could find that would give me up-to-date weather. Um, and so I was able to see along my route whether I had a storm coming my way or whether I was going to be clear. I know a lot of you travel too for your, your work out into areas, so I find that this tool is really helpful and I will use this going forward whenever I'm doing business travel or driving or flying. Um, another business travel related tool, um, I also love this for personal use as well, it's airfarewatchdog.com. It is a it's an email, actually. It's, it's a site, but you can also sign up for flight alerts that give you, that send along right into your inbox airfare, airfare deals and money saving tips. Um, so, this is, I set up an alert from San Francisco to Lima. Um, this is not a business trip. This would actually be a trip for fun. But you can see here, they send me an email that says this is the lowest rate within the next 30 days. And I can also update my route and easily sign up for other alerts. And I also just get really good tips from them. Um, just as a side note, it's not in here, but another one that I like is called Hopper. It is an app that you can access and it will show you, it will give you a sense of whether to wait to buy a flight or whether you should actually hop on and that's a pretty good deal and you should buy it right away. And my next tip is the LSNTAP survey bank. Um, I'm all about not recreating the wheel and this is a great tool to help you do that. There, it gives you access to surveys that have been used specifically in the legal tech community before. So recently at ProBonoNet, we wanted to do spin up a, a user survey, uh, an end user survey, and so we looked here at the survey bank. Sometimes creating questions is more of an art than a science, and so I referred to this site for some good ideas. And then I also, and my other tip is writeclearly.org. I should note that this has been developed by the legal tech community. Writeclearly.org is where you can find resources to create plain language legal documents online. And it provides access to a library of plain language documents in their plain language library, as well as a tool to analyze the reading level of web pages and suggest improvements for readability. And it also has a tool to help define complex legal terms on your website, um, which was, uh, it's called Read Clearly. It was developed by Open Advocate. So I strongly encourage you to check that out, especially for those of you who are creating uh, client-facing websites. And then my next tip, actually you can, the next few tips build on one another. Um, but I will I will get to that um, shortly. So the the this tip is feed rinse, and I personally love RSS feeds. I knowing that we're in the access to justice tech world, there's. I feel like there's so many intersections and so many different pieces of news that I could be following along tech, along what's going on in the access to justice world, around working and productivity, and because I strongly believe that information is power, I love to be able to stay on top of information, but sometimes that can be really complicated. So I've my, personally been interested in how you can make it as easy as possible for yourself to stay on top of as much information as possible. So this is the first tool that helps kind of achieve that goal and FeedRinse is an easy tool that lets you automatically filter out syndicated content or RSS feeds that you aren't interested in. And it's essentially like a spam filter for your RSS subscriptions. I, I really like to use this. It's a free tool um, and you can import feeds. I don't think there's a limit on this. Um, and then you can set up your filters and enjoy, enjoy your feeds. Um, the next one is RSX, RSS Mix. So this one, it actually allows you to aggregate all of your feeds. Um, so you can mix any number of feeds together to display a number of stories in one feed. 
Uh, I also like Feedly. It's a great RSS feed reader to do this. Um, it allows you to put as many feeds together. It actually allows you to filter out feeds as well. But where it's it's a little where I like to combine uh, feed, Feedly, excuse me, feed mix or RSS mix and feed rinse is then porting it in to blog trotter once you've got all of your feeds because that essentially is a nifty tool that delivers updates from all of your favorite RSS feeds right into your inbox which gives you the ability and the flexibility to stay updated while on the go so when you're using these three tools together RSS mix, feed rinse, and blog trotter, you basically get all of the feeds that you would want without the information that you don't want right into your admin and right into your email. And then the final piece of that is, and actually the last, the last, um, the last tip that I have, and it's actually our 51st, 51st tip. We threw in a bonus tip for you all this year is legal tech RSS feeds. There is a lot of content online where you can grab legal tech RSS feeds and either place them on your own website or into an RSS either feed reader like Feedly or through FeedRinse or FeedMix. ProBonoNet on the news and calendar tool on our site just as an example for on all of our news and calendar tools we offer an RSS Capability, so you can just go and grab grab the content here, and pull in all of these, all of the information that's coming in through the news tool, and then basically get that right into your inbox. So it's a great way to stay on top of information. It it does take a little bit of time to configure all of this to the way that you want it, but it's definitely worth it. I've done this for myself personally to follow to follow and stay on top of news, and then also done this for our communications team as well. And then um, this is actually how we populate our news, is we follow a lot of RSS feeds to get that information up to date. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. I wanted to do a special shout out to our presenters. Um, thank you so much also to our attendees.